he's probably one of the best friends. Well, there's no question about it. He's the best friend I've ever had. You know, it's just Brother Leninger said that. If you ever have, you know, <clears throat> if you ever have a, a true, a true friend, you know, a true friend, someone that can know everything about you, and never ever use it against you. And that's the way Brother Bud and I are. You know, he can tell me anything, and I can tell him anything, no matter what spirit I'm in. <laughs> and he, he won't. You know, sometimes a, a friend might use things against you if you make them mad enough. But when you can't make a friend mad enough that they ever say anything bad about you to anybody else, you've got a friend. And that's the relationship Brother Bud and I have had. We're closer than brothers, really. In fact, since Eudora, since Eudora died, I don't guess there's been a day go by that we haven't talked on the phone. And normally he calls me every night, you know, because he's lonesome at night. During the day, he can keep himself busy. He's a people person. He's, he, he's you know, he exercises a lot. <clears throat> Brother Dennis White, the pastor there, said, or he's assistant pastor, but he, he said he's the healthiest guy in our church. <laughs> but then this coronavirus hit him, and it's just taking him down. It's he's he's strong everywhere else, but he he just can't breathe. That's his problem. It's it's filled his lungs with pneumonia and, and took his breathing away from him, and he just can't function. Of course, you can't function without breath. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I'm already missing him, you know, because he's been in the hospital over two weeks. And hadn't been. He's talked to me just a handful of times. But last time I talked to him, he had such short breath, I couldn't hardly understand all what he was saying. But anyway, uh, you know, losing him and Sister Eudora both this year is just un unthought of. We just never would have. We thought we were going to to Oregon, the West Coast together this year. But you never know when, you know, you're, what you think you're going to do is not ever going to happen. Anyway, I'm still asking the Lord for a miracle, and I, I believe that, you know, it's still possible. I'm like David his little son, I think we ought to just keep holding on to God until we, I've been telling the Lord, I told the Lord yesterday, I said, you can fix this. I know you can. I said, I'm like the man, little man in the Bible, the, the centurion over Roman soldiers. I said, I've, I've been a man that's had authority in business, and I could tell people what to do, and they'd go do it. And he told him, he said, you don't have to go to my house. Just say the word. It'll get down, I know. And Jesus said, I hadn't found faith like that anywhere in Israel. And so I reminded the Lord of that yesterday. I said, I know you can do it. Just all you got to do is say it. And the thought hit my mind, well, what if it's not his will? I said, you can work it in your will. <laughs> I said, you can fix it. <laughs> Uh, but ultimately we know we have to accept what the Lord does he's in charge <clears throat> um, I'm going to give you all the, the phases of the church today um, most of you know what they are but you won't you won't know how to put all these scriptures to it. So knowing what these scriptures are, I think, will help you. <clears throat> so there, there's four phases to the Gentile church being restored is what I'm talking about, the, the four ch phases of the Gentile church. Um, and Brother Leninger, he had... Uh, you know, I was listening to him on tape, and uh, you know, there were, it, it it blesses me when when Brother Linegar and I would be talking about something, and 
and I would give him something I felt like the Lord gave me, and then I'd hear him preach it. That always blesses me because I think he, he, he confirmed what I said was right because <laughs> he liked it. I uh, remember when I talked on the <clears throat> uh, eight steps to perfection, Second, Second Peter 1, he got up right here in Little Rock in our minister's meeting and taught it, but he, before he taught it, he taught and told them that he got it from me. You know, most ministers probably wouldn't do that. They'd just go ahead and teach it like it's theirs. <clears throat> Which it is his. It's the Lord's. It ain't none of, you know, what did Paul say? What have you got that you hadn't received? You know, this all comes from the Lord, so nobody can take credit for it. But I do like how God uses different men. <clears throat> In fact, I've been, you know, you all know I've been talking quite a bit recently about iniquity. And I've been showing you how iniquity is your own way, using the 119th Psalm, third verse. And I've been studying on that more and talking on it more. I was talking to Brother Dale Strite the other day, and God gave him something on iniquity several years ago, just like the Lord gave that scripture to me, and he was sharing with me what he had on it. And I was sharing with him. He said, well, I didn't have that verse, but I've got other verses. <coughs> and uh, so... Anyway, we talked on it. I asked him to send me. He said, I wrote an article on that several years ago, but I didn't even get what I wrote. He said, I recently read it and got it. <laughs> I said, send it to me. He did. And I was, the other morning I was awake. It was, uh, I think it was just a few minutes after 3 o'clock, and I couldn't sleep. I've been praying for Brother Bud through the night some. and So... I got that article and read it, and I began to weep. You know, God began to show me more about myself that I need. I still need his help. I, I'm going to teach on that before long, but not this morning. But I will tell you this. Iniquity, iniquity is not sin. Iniquity is, it is doing your own will it's it's the old man and it's what causes you to sin iniquity will bring forth sin that's really and i'll show you in scriptures how iniquity how god uses iniquity and sin as two different things and uh, but the lord's really helping me to see you know more about why your way is the way it is <laughs> I'll give you this little story before I go into the phases of the church. Uh, I used to be a deer hunter. I used to, and I never was what I would call an avid deer hunter. But I did hunt enough, you know, I was raised in the country. and So, <clears throat> brother, brother, brother Strite was sharing with me, too. And he used to deer hunt, and it reminded me of my youth a lot. He was telling me when his grandfather, of course, he's, he lives in Montezuma, Montezuma, Montana. He was telling how his granddad and his uncles and cousins, and once a year they'd all get their gear together and saddle all their horses, and they'd ride up into the mountains. And they'd ride up there and spend about two weeks, and they wouldn't come back till everybody got their game. And that reminded him my family, my my grandparents, my my aunts and uncles, my dad. We had a place up in the mountains, up above uh, Old Smoky, and up in uh, uh, where we had. They had a cabin. I don't know. I don't know where that cabin came. They built it many many years ago, but we never did saddle our horses and go up there, but we did go up there in jeeps and old trucks and and uh, stayed in the cabin and we stayed up there for, I don't know how long we was up there, a week or 10 days maybe, and hunted up, in the, you know, we had a fire in a fireplace and or in an old wood stove and, and we hunted up in them mountains. 
that those created you know great memories for all of us and and uh, but anyway, I'll tell you this about you know hunting a deer. If you want to be a deer hunter or any game, big game hunter, elk, moose, uh, anything, bear, whatever. But like in hunting deer, uh, you need to go out and begin to learn something about a deer before you hunt them, because uh, when it becomes seed hunting seasons is at, just after rutting season starts and uh, deer male deers have a perimeter that they that they work they work that perimeter they'll they'll rut they'll make rut marks and they'll mark those rut marks with their own urine and then they'll check those rut they'll check that perimeter every day and if there's been a female in there and she's in heat, she'll mark it, and then he'll he'll track her. Well, but if you go somewhere and you uh, if you find that if you find his perimeter, you can hide outside his perimeter, and you know that he, you're going to see that deer, that buck. But if you see a nice big buck and you want that buck, well, wherever you saw him, if you'll hide near that place upwind from the direction he was going because he'll smell you if you're downwind he'll pick that up but if you go you know and you hide there in the direction he was going he's going to go that same direction because he knows exactly where he's going he knows his trail he knows his own way I'm using this showing you how we do our own thing you know and so if you go back there and hide there, he will come through there. Of course, if he's ever seen a lion or a mountain lion or, you know, well, he, he once he sees one, if it gets after him, he'll run exactly down his path because he knows where he's going. He knows all good watering holes. He knows all safe places to sleep. He knows where all the berries are and where to eat. He's got a pathway that he's learned, and all God's intelligent beings are created this way. And so, uh, he's got a good. If he's fast enough, he's got a good chance of getting away from that mountain lion, because that mountain lion don't know that path, and he don't know how to. He don't know how to. He doesn't know exactly like he does ever ever turn and ever bush and ever everything that he's going to do. Anyway, that's how. You know, all of us, we've got our own own way. It's our iniquity. It's our own. We're walking in our own way. We're all right in our own ways. The Bible says every man is right in his own way. So anyway, that's what iniquity is. It's walking in your own way. And then it will bring forth sin. It's like a tree. It's like a tree that has fruit. Uh, fruit is, you know, if you use a tree as a type, then fruit's the sin. And that tree will keep bringing forth fruit. You keep taking fruit from it, it'll keep producing fruit. You keep, you know, the tree is iniquity. The fruit is the sin it produced. That's a good way to understand iniquity. I'll give you more scriptures on it. In fact, I'll give you a way to identify iniquity in your own life and how to overcome it. You know, we'll work on that. Anyway, I think that's a really important teaching. But today I'm going to give you these church phases. Y'all will remember most of them, but I just want to put them together for you so when you read these things, you'll be able to identify them as, as what God was showing in types and uh, in prophecy down through the Bible. And Isaiah, I mean, Genesis 26, the 26th uh, chapter, you remember when Isaac... Uh, begin to drill wells, those four wells. Here, these four wells are four phases of the church. And so the first well, which is in Genesis 26 and 20, the herdmen of Gerar, Gerar, Gerar did strive with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water's ours. And he called the name of the well Esek, because they strove with him. If you remember... 
Abimelech run Isaac off and because he was afraid of him, really. And uh, so he went into Gerar and, and drilled, and he found well. All these wells I, Abraham had dug, but uh, the Philistines had filled up, filled up the wells and, with dirt and run, run Abraham out. And uh, so this first way he called it Esek. And that word means, it means contention. And that's a that is a picture in restoration of Protestantism. The first move of restoration was Protestantism out of Catholicism. Protestantism was the first well that was dug. And they contended with the Catholic Church to establish Protestantism. And then of course um, because the um, the um, who was it that uh, the Philistines contended with Isaac's herdsmen, or <clears throat> they they said this water's ours, <laughs> and that's you know, uh, and so uh, they had to dig another well. So Isaac went and dug another well, and the name of that well in the 21st verse was Sitna. And that, that is the Pentecostal era, or phase of the church. And, uh, you know, when you read the whole story, it it probably mean more to you, but I'm, I don't have time to go over every, every bit of it with you, but uh, Sitna means to strive. It's strife. And the Pente- there was a lot of strife in the Pentecostal era. And uh, so Isaac removed from there and dig- he dug another well. And that well is called Rehoboth. And that word means there's room. Uh, God's made room for us, it says. Um, and he said you'd be fruitful in the land. And that is a picture... Uh, of the body of Christ in this 30-year period, the last phase of the the body of Christ and the church being restored. And then finally, um, the Lord appeared unto him the same night <clears throat> and said, I am God of Abraham, thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seeds for my servant Abraham's sake, and he builded an altar there and called that uh, called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there, and there were Isaac's servants there, and there Isaac's servants digged a well. And that's what we're doing is we're rebuilding the altar. We're, and everything is going on that altar except for Jesus Christ. Brother Leninger, he'd say it like this. He'd say, everything's going on the altar. Your wives and your children, it don't make no difference what it is or who it is or going on the altar. <laughs> he, he would get that plain with stuff. It don't matter if it's your wife or who it is, he'd say. Uh, you have to put your life on the altar. That's, that's part of this message that I'll give you on, on iniquity. That's, you got to overcome iniquity and you got to know what iniquity it is and how to overcome it or you never will and if you don't overcome it you won't make it so uh, anyway they deal they dig the well um, I'll uh, uh, where is it 32nd verse and came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him concerning the well which they had digged, and they said unto him, We have found water, and he called it Sheba. And therefore the name of the city is Beersheba unto this day. And that word Sheba means an oath. That's, that's the divine order of God in a restored church. And so there's, I'm just going to give you some phases in the Bible that when you read, when you read and hear these things, you you can know that what it's talking about. 
Okay, then let's turn to Zechariah, the first chapter. And here, Brother Leninger talked on these. Um, We may have added to it some, but he did talk on them. Zechariah, the first, first chapter, and um, verse 17 says, Cry yet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, My cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad, and the Lord shall comfort Zion, and, and shall yet choose Jerusalem. Then lifted I my, up my eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, What be these? And he answered me, These are the horns which have scattered Jerusalem, Israel, and Jerusalem. And the Lord showed me four carpenters. These four horns were Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And, of course, this applied to natural Israel, too, uh, because those four horns scattered Israel all down through time from Babylon right on down to Rome. But we're, we, we still, the Gentile church suffered Rome, and the church had to be restored from that. Um, and so um, those four horns, were that's who it was, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And then... The Lord showed me four carpenters, he said. He said, what, what, uh, what come these to do? And he spake, saying, These are the horns which have scattered Jerusalem, so that no man did lift up his head, but these, talking about the carpenters, are come to fray them and to cast them, cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. So these four horns are exactly the same that the four wells were. The four horns is is Protestantism, Pentecostalism, the uh, body of Christ in restoration over over 30 years, which I say we're already in, and then the divine order of God. The horns are Uh, carpenters. The horns are... uh, The carpenters, I'm sorry if I said horns. The carpenters are these four phases of the church in restoration. Protestantism, Pentecostalism, the body of Christ in restoration, and the the church restored. Uh, So those those horns are, are those carpenters frayed those horns and repaired what the horns tore up. Uh, it's the same as the horns are the same as in let's see Joel. Go back to Joel, the first chapter, and um, these are this, the horns are the same as these four four worms in Joel one. Uh, for a nation has come, verse six. Joel 1 and 6. Up upon my land, strong without number, whose teeth are teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek of a great lion. That's Babylon. And he hath laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare and cast it away, and branches thereof are made white. Lament like a virgin, girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. Um, so, but, but he was showing that after these worms. Go, go back now to the third verse where it says, Tell ye your children of it, let your children tell their children and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left the caterpillars eaten. That's Babylon, the palmer worm, Medo Persia, the locust. Then uh, Greece, the canker worm, and Rome, the caterpillar. Those those are the same as the four horns that uh, that scattered Israel and Judah. Uh, so those are the 
the, those, I'm just showing you those are the same as the horns. That, that's not the same as the carpenters, of course. But I'm just showing you it always goes with it. Um, okay, then in, in uh, 2 Peter, I mentioned that to you earlier, and we've been over it many times, but I just want to couple it together with these phases of the church. I'm showing you the four wells, the four carpenters, and now, 2 Peter 1, uh, and those are those principles that, that uh, are established by Peter's teaching here that uh, in the, let's start in the fourth verse where it says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, now he gives the phases. Add to your faith virtue. See, Martin Luther established, he, he restored faith, the gate that you get in. In other words, the... the the outer court, the temple is going to have to be restored. And, and even the outer court, the order of it has to be restored. And so that, in, that was Protestantism restored faith and virtue. Martin Luther established faith, but it was probably John and Charles Wesley who began to teach on sanctification, that you can't just have faith. You've got to live a dedicated life and put put things of the world out of your life. And that was sanctification, which added virtue. The word virtue means strength. Remember Jesus, when the little woman was with an issue of blood, when she worked her way through the crowd and touched the hem of his garment, he immediately turned around and he said, I felt virtue go out of me. That was strength. He felt the power of God go out of him. And... When you leave faith and go to the altar and start offering up your life as a sacrifice, you know, that's, we're, I'm going to tell you all something. We're living in a world right now. It's tough. It's tough in this world to help too many people because n almost nobody can stand correction. You start correcting people, they get mad, they run you down, they, they hear everything you've got to say about correction, but they don't hear your love. You can add all kind of love with it, but all they hear is the correction because they are so uh, they're so uh, sensitive to to the flesh that the flesh can't take correction. You start trying to correct people, you 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 make an enemy. What what does the psalm? What does the proverb say? He says, "Correct a fool, and you'll get to yourself of what blot. They'll blot you out." They'll hate you for it, but but instruct a wise man, and he'll yet become wiser. So, <clears throat> but faith and virtue. Virtue is strength, and that faith and virtues was established in the Pentecost in the Protestant movement. They're the ones that began to restore that, and and to knowledge. Now, you add to virtue. I mean, to virtue, knowledge and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience. I say all three of those came in the labor, which was the body of Christ. It's the, I'm sorry, not the body of Christ, but the Pentecostal movement. The Pentecostal movement, God began to give knowledge, and Brother William Souders is the, was the heart of the Pentecostal movement because... It wasn't very long after Pentecostal movement. It, 19, you know, it was established. The Holy Ghost was poured out in Topeka, Kansas in 1901, 1903. It was pretty well established after going to Houston and to Azusa Street in Los Angeles and moving across to America. By 1903, it was established, and Brother Souders' ministry started in about 1914. And... Uh, that's when Pentecostal organizations began to be set up. Assemblies of God was set up in 1914, right here in Hot Springs, Arkansas. 
And, uh, but Brother Souders had a dream. He was going to that meeting, but he was praying about it. And he had a dream the night before, and God showed him not to go to that meeting. And that's where they organized uh, the Trinitarians among the Pente uh, Pentecostal movement and the Assemblies of God. Well, uh, so the, the, we were, you know, the Pentecostal group was given knowledge. I don't know how much temperance they actually got in it. They got more knowledge, but here in the body of Christ is where God really began to reveal knowledge. And then temperance. Temperance is understanding. Once you are tempered in knowledge, it becomes part of your understanding about God. God, God will work. He'll temper you. He'll try you. He'll put you, you know, he'll put you through tests and temp trials. And then patience. Patience actually is, turns into wisdom. Wisdom, uh, you know, God's learning God's patience, learning how to know uh, how, when to use understanding, when to to. Uh, put those things into practice. <clears throat> and then patience, you add godliness and godly, godliness, brother brotherly kindness, and that is the putting on of the linen garment. The, high, the priest had to offer up sacrifices on the altar, go wash himself in the labor, and then he had to change out of a woolen garment into a white linen garment to go into the holy place. And uh, that's where we're at right now. We're in, we're in the garment change phase. We're, we're trying to put on a white linen garment, which is righteousness. And in that, we will become godlike. Add to patience godliness, godlikeness. And then add to godlikeness brotherly love. There's, there's where if you become like God, you're going to start loving your brother. Like I said, you 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 got to become a brother that stick close. You got to be closer than a brother to be a to have brotherly love. Uh, I got two brothers, and I don't. We don't have a whole lot in common. Neither one of us. I mean, we we, we love each other as far as blood kin is concerned. But like I said, brother Bud and I are far closer than either one of my brothers to me. Because we have a vision alike, and, and somewhere or another, God put us together. We're both pilots. We, you know, we we just somehow or another, the Lord put us together, and we're not we're not all that alike. I mean, you know, He we we don't agree on the Word of God in several areas, but we agree on the vision that we have, and we're wa willing to be patient until God works any of our differences out with each other, so we leave one another alone. Every once in a while we'll get in a little debate with each other and then we just have to we just have to put that down and shut the door and let that rest a while. He you know, I don't know if I told you about one time me and him got after we went home after a minister's meeting service one night. We was in the same motel and we I called him on the phone. We started talking about the subject of that night. We got so mad at one another. We was yelling at one another over the phone. He finally just slammed down the phone, hung up on me. <laughs> I said, "Well, I think we better leave it right there <laughs> for right now." <laughs> oh Lord! He said, "Anybody believe that is crazy." <laughs> I said, "I." I said, if "Anybody believe what you teach? It's crazy too." <laughs> oh God. Anyway, godliness and brotherly love, and to brotherly love, charity. And there's where you go into the holy place. Charity is the love of God. And by the way, okay, so faith is, is the number one principle when you first come into this through faith. Then, then the next phase is humility. So you've got to be humble enough to... Get on the altar and repent of your sins. Be baptized and begin to obey God and obey commandments. That takes humility. And then the laver, 
is the fear of God. There's where the fear of God comes. And uh, when you begin to get knowledge of God, the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of fear is knowledge is the beginning of fear, Solomon said in Proverbs. And so when you begin to get knowledge, more knowledge, uh, God's going to require him to know what to do right and do it not to him. It's sin. And he who uh, is given much, much is required. So God, God requires of you. And, and, uh, and then, uh, uh, then, then when you start putting on a white linen garment, that's honor. When you, you, you won't become righteous till you really have the proper honor for God. And first, it'll, you'll have to honor your brother. If you love not your brother whom you have seen, how are you going to love God whom you have not seen? So you've got to get to a place where you can love your brother, no matter even if he don't believe like you, no matter if you all can't agree on everything, you still got to love him. The love of God, you've got to get to a place. I used to use it like this. I used to say, well, if, if you have brotherly love and you got a $20 bill, you give me at least $10 of it. You know, you give me half of it. You treat me like you want to be treated, but you ain't gonna you ain't gonna give me the whole twenty until you get charity. You get to the place where you got the love of God, and you'll give your brother everything you got. You give your life up for your brother. So I don't know how many of y'all got twenty dollars today. Anyway, <clears throat> by the way, thank you for my birthday offering. It's a, it's, I think it's enough money to, for me to go buy a new suit. And I'm going to get a new suit. I'm going to get me, I think that's what I'm going to buy for my birthday offering. I'm, I'm getting to like my birthdays. You know, y'all, I like, I, I like y'all treating me good on my birthday. I'm starting to get like Brother Bud. He said, we can't go out of town August the 19th. That's my birthday. He said, I got to be here. They'll have something for me. He said, I said, okay. <laughs> but I said, well, my birthday's September the 4th. You want to go right after October 9th? What about my birthday? He said, well, your birthday ain't that important. <laughs> All right, so uh, those are those four principles. Faith, humility, fear of God, and honor. And, of course... If you want to call it the principle, the love of God, charity is really the true love of God. That's what it is. All right, then the next four phases is, yes. Yes, faith. And faith and no, no virtue. Virtue. Where do you where are you seeing diligence? Huh? Oh, giving all diligence oh. add okay. to your faith. So, in other words, just just saying, be diligent enough to do these things. I'm telling you. So you faith off is part faith. of Protestantism. Faith and Virtue. Virtue. That's Protestantism. Yes. Then the, that, then the labor is Pentecostalism. Knowledge, temperance, and patience. Then brotherly, uh, godliness and brotherly kindness is honor. You've got to honor God enough to ever become like him. You're going to have to let him in your life and honor him above yourself. And then you're going to have to learn how to honor your brother. Once you start getting enough honor for God, you'll start honoring your brother or vice versa too. Um, okay, then the next, the last phase is the four angels that's of your of the river Euphrates that are loosed in in Revelations the ninth chapter. Uh, we don't have much time, but I'll just hurriedly. Y'all have heard me on it before, so. But I'm just trying to give you these things set up because, you know. It helps you go know what all these scriptures are actually referring to uh, in type, as well as um, 
fulfilled prophecy. Many prophecies of the Old Testament is referring to spiritual Israel and, spirit, and spiritual church of Gen the Gentile world. Even though it may have a natural may have a natural meaning, just like the horns showed what they were. The carpenters, don't you know they didn't they couldn't figure out what them carpenters was? Don't you know there you remember what, what Peter that said or Jesus said it to his disciples, said, Blessed are your ears and hear your ears and your eyes. For he said the 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 law the prophets have longed to look into the things that you do now see and hear. They didn't have they they wanted to know what they meant, but they couldn't figure it all out. Well, God's been very good to us to bless us. Of course, the early church had it, but we're now we're getting it all. Okay, in Revelations nine, the sixth angel. This is the sixth trumpet sounds, verse thirteen. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels, the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay a third part of men. Well, <clears throat> uh, those, those time frames, you have to get them in order. The first one was a year, which is a prophetical 360 years. And that was Protestantism. You know, I talked on that here just, when was it? Did I talk on that Thursday night? And uh, I gave that time frame and that timetable. And I know I kind of gave that out. Uh, Sister Smith got on to me. She said, you run through that so fast. She said, you're getting where you sound just like Brother Leninger. She said, you, you've been listening to him. And when you listen to him, you start talking like him. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. I, th I think he's, that was a compliment to me. <laughs> anyway... Um, so that 360 years is Protestantism, all right? And then the 100 years, the day, and I explained that Thursday night, how it was a 250-year jubilees, which made up 100 years from Brother Souders, from, from the establishment of Pentecostalism in the United States until uh, God healed this body. The new experience in 53 was the 50 years of Jubilee of Brother William Souders and then another 50 years of Brother Leninger of 2003 when God healed this body, began to give a healing to this body and bring it all back together. Uh, so, and that that is in the Pentecostal era. I said this body is the, it is the, crux are the center the focus of God what God was doing in among the Pentecost and then the the month is 30 prophetical years that is the body of Christ in restore in restoration period we're being restored this last 30 years is what's restored we're no longer in the Pentecostal era we're in a restored church era and it's it's only happening to the body of Christ and then the 15 years are the hour. The pro last prophetical hour will be the, the restored church and the harvest in the end of this world. And so that, that, that's the four angels that... Uh, uh, so you've got the four wells, the four carpenters, Explaining the horns and the worms of Zechariah 1 and Joel 1. Uh, the four the principles, four principles, faith, humility, fear of God, and honor in Second Peter 1. And then the four angels loosed in the river Euphrates. And they all are referring to the four phases of the, of the Gentile church and from the beginning of restoration till its full restoration. All right. I just thought I'd give that. To, I don't think I've ever laid that out just exactly like that, where you got all of it put together. So if I come up with four more somewhere, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs>
By the way, Brother Brother Painter, Brother Matthew helped Brother Painter yesterday, and they got up the two new overhead projectors. So you got new projectors up. Praise God for that. We're thankful for that. Appreciate everybody being here today. We'll take a break and see you upstairs. <laughs>